got a good place to come, roof over our head, hope you had plenty to eat, we got a lot to be thankful for, if you know the Lord, you've got everything to be thankful for, amen, everything. All right, now, last week I started a study with you on dispensations and mysteries. And to get a hold of that is to get a is to get a good foundation in rightly dividing the word of truth. Scripture has definite divisions, and uh, and and when you know that, it'll help you in understanding what I'm talking about. For example, turn over here to First Peter chapter number one and verse number ten. First Peter chapter number one. And verse number 10. Now the Apostle Peter, obviously, we know who we're talking about here, is one of the twelve. And uh, in, uh, in, some, uh, in some places he is, uh, he's elevated above the other apostles. Chapter number 1 and verse number 10. Now the Apostle Peter, obviously, we know who we're talking about here, is one of the twelve. And uh, in, uh, in, some, uh, in some places he is, uh, he's elevated above the other apostles and said to be the foundation of the church. I don't believe that, but I do believe that Peter is, a, is one of the twelve and, and very gifted in the sense that God inspired him to write scripture. And notice what it says in verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now look at verse 10 very carefully. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now look at this now. Here's the divisions. Searching what or what manner of time. There's that element. See the time of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things now did you get that now let's read that again that's important unto whom it was revealed it was revealed to the prophets that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now the scripture says plainly the angels were the mediators of the Old Testament, given by the hands of angels. Old Testament, not the new. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that in the church, might be made known the manifold wisdom of God through the church. It displays the wisdom of God. That's quite a thought. But now look at this thing very carefully in verse number 10, verse 11. It testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now the Talmud today, which is the book of faith that... Uh, rabbinic Judaism turns to, and uh, the reason I say that is because Kairite Jews don't use the Talmud, they stick with the Bible. But rabbinic Jews, which is the vast majority of Jews, use the Talmud as their interpretation of the Old Testament. And the Talmud, of course, as I've told you time and time and time again, is in written down what was verbally given to the, uh, to the fathers, and there therefore are two laws there is a written law, which is what you have in your Bible, and an oral law, which became the basis of the Talmud. The Jews reject Christ today because they say that he did not come and establish the kingdom, that he was not the promised Messiah because there was nothing. He, died, he simply died a martyr's death. But some of the Jews that dig a little deeper will tell you that there is definitely two strains or two lines of messianic prophecies in the Bible. One of them has to do with a suffering Messiah, and the other one has to do with a reigning Messiah. Now, how can he suffer and reign both at the same time, you see? How can one man suffer and one man reign? 
these men have said, well, there has to be two messiahs. And, of course, that's logic. But the problem is, the New Testament, when it deals with Christ, the messianic ministry of Christ, has to do with the time element. That's how you understand this. What's that mean? That means that when he came the first time, he came to suffer. The suffering Savior, the suffering Lamb of God, he will come again as the ruling Lord God Almighty. See that? But it's just one man. One man. Two distinct periods of time, though, in his ministry. All right? Rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible has divisions. It has dispensations. It has periods of time that are clearly delineated. And there's no way to get around it. So what are we waiting for then? We're waiting for the righteous rule and reign of the only righteous one who has ever lived. And the thing that marks his millennial kingdom is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll reign in righteousness. Why do you put so much emphasis? Because in order for the earth to have peace, there must be righteousness. Else man will continue to kill and kill and kill and kill and kill. We're getting good at wars, folks. Amen. I mean, we can kill by the tens of thousands. We can kill a whole lot of people real good at it. And uh, the scripture says the time's going to come when they beat their what? Right? And their swords into and that time. Now, you know, if the UN, they've got that scripture quoted somewhere up there on the wall or somewhere at the UN. Of course, the idea with the UN, United Nations, is that they, by, by uh, diplomacy, are going to be able to bring in peace on the earth. All right. This peace is the is the tactic that the Antichrist will use, according to the book of Daniel, by peace or by peacefulness will he enter in. He will come promising peace. And he'll he will not bring peace, he'll bring a sword. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. All right, all of that has to do with the with the matter of uh, uh, when that something is going to be revealed. And, and uh, the issue, let me show you something else over here. Let me find the scripture text. If I could remember all these, let's see. Look at Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 10. Luke 8, 10. Luke chapter number 8 and verse 10. Now this is a very powerful scripture. Some scripture text, all scripture is beautiful and, and profitable and, and inspired. But some scriptures are very, very powerful that other scriptures have to rely upon. Look at verse 10, Luke 8. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables. Now, look at this. That seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you heard people teach on parables and they say, well, it's, a, it's an earthly message with a heavenly meaning or something like that, but never really get into the issue of why it was given to begin with? What was the purpose of a parable? What's it about? And when you understand the purpose of the parable and the time the parables began to be used and who gave them the parables, then you begin to see how the Bible opens up one more time. It wasn't until they had officially rejected him and set about to kill him until he went into parables. And he went into parables for a reason. He quotes it here. If you look at it in chapter number 8 and verse number 10. But to others, after the colon, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now why would he quote this? And where did he quote he quoted Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter number 6. He's called the Prince of Prophets. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 6. Now, of course, when I say he's called the Prince of Prophets, that's an arbitrary distinction. That's a man-made term. Nowhere in the Bible does it call Isaiah the Prince of Prophets. He's a prophet and a great one. No question about that. But it doesn't, he's not better than Ezekiel, or he's not better than Daniel. Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah chapter number 6, 
and verse number one, the king, the year that King Uzziah died, who's Uzziah? Uzziah is a king who violated the holy office of a prophet, of a priest rather, and when he did, he was smitten with leprosy. It rose right up in his face. In other words, the priests were standing right there. They told him, you can't do this. He went in there and did it. And when he came back out, the leprosy began to come on his face right in front of them. They watched him. Had God done, he'd smitten him with, uh, he'd smitten him with leprosy. Now, so in the year that King Uzziah died, a leprous king, this is contrast. This is contrasting leprosy, which is a type of death, a type of, the, of, of death, not only in the death in the sense that it dies, but in the moral decay that's associated with death, the eating away, see. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So here's the glory of God contrasted with an earthly king. Above it stood the seraphim. These are burning balls of fire that cry, holy, holy, holy. What's a seraphim? A burning ball of fire. <laughs> it's an angelic being. That's, a, that's all I know. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. Two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried to the other. This is Antiphony. 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 In other words, you say something. This one over here says something. Then back in response, they say something. This is how they entered into the temple. This is how they rose to the highest point on the temple mount. 5,000 male voice choir singing. Over here, they sing. Over here, they answer. Over here, they sing. Over here, they answer. You remember when, uh, when uh, uh, David and, and, and Saul came back from, uh, from, the, from their battle, and one group sang, uh, uh, Saul has killed his thousands? And what did the other group say? And, and, and David has killed his ten thousands. That's what they're doing. They're answering to each other. He's killed a thousand. The other side said, well, he killed ten thousand. So it says over here, one cried to the other and said, holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Separate, separate, separate. He can't be touched. He can't be seen. He can't be known. You wouldn't even know he existed lest he makes himself known by revelation. And all you'll ever know about God is what he reveals to us. You'll never find him. You'll never find out about him. The only way you can ever know him is when he makes himself known to us. As creatures, we're all creatures, we can know that there's got to be a God. It's called the teleological argument that all of this out here didn't just pop up all of a sudden from somewhere. It was created. So we know that by intuition. Look at verse number three. One cried to another, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the, old, the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, which we all do when we come into the presence of this. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from off the altar. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will I go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. He said, Go and tell this people. Hear you indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. That's remarkable, because he said, I want you to go, Isaiah, and I want you to preach to these people. You've been anointed, you've been cleansed, you've been purged, you've been sanctified. You go out and preach to these people, and when you preach to these people... I'm going to shut their eyes and I'm going to close their ears and I'm going to harden their heart and they're not going to be able to believe because I'm bringing judicial judgment upon them as a unit, as a collective body. And that's one of the greatest truths in the whole Bible. There is the individual judgment and individual accountability, but there is also a time when God brings judgment on a whole body of people, on a collective body. And this is what's happening here. I want you to go out and I want you to tell Israel that they are going into darkness and they'll not be able to see nor will they be able to hear. Why does he do that? He does that to protect them. He does that to protect them. 
Look at 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6. First Samuel six six. Now I mean to know the story here about the ark. The ark was taken in combat. Israel lost it. You remember the old, uh, the old uh, priest that uh, was heavy, he was, and he he heard the word that uh, his two sons, what were their names, Hophni and Phinehas, had been killed. And uh, one of their, one of their uh, wives, she was with child. And when the word came that he had, or the daddy had died, what did she do? She named him, what did she name him? Ichabod. <coughs> and that means the glory hath departed. So they carried off the ark into Philistine land. Dagon had a hard time. After a few months, they decided to get rid of this ark. Now watch this. We're talking about people that don't have a Bible, they don't have a priesthood, they don't have a temple, they have no, they have no one standing, uh, dividing the scripture, teaching it to them. These are Philistines. This is the enemy of Israel. Look what they knew. This is quite remarkable. The Bible says over here in 1 Samuel chapter number 6, they wanted to give verse 4. They said, what shall we be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? In other words, this God of, uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this God of Israel, we need to appease him. We, we got some problems going on here in Philistine land. We need to make him happy. See, well, they're speaking out of ignorance. They're pagans. They're following what they knew. They didn't know anything, but they had heard some things. How do you know that? Watch this. And uh, they go through all the mice and emrods and all that. Verse 5, what shall make me images of your emrods, images of your teraphim, an image of your, of your mice that mar the land. Ye shall give glory to the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Now look at verse 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts? As the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Now who said that? That didn't come from Isaiah. That didn't come from Jeremiah. Do you know who, do you know who said this? A Philistine. Is it true, preacher? It is 100% true. And look how they applied it. They had heard. You see, you can't come out of Egypt like they did. You can't come out of a, a power. Egypt was not just a regional power. Egypt was a major power like Babylon or the Assyrians. And so here they have come out of Egypt. They've been delivered from the Egyptians. And the word had spread quickly about how that these slaves had overthrown the great Egyptian army. And Rahab the harlot had heard about it in Jericho. The word had spread all over the place. And the Philistines had heard about it too. And a smart Philistine said, I know we got a bunch of gods in here, but there's a God over there that's a whole lot bigger than our gods. They're superstitious. They're just pagan people. But he followed the light he had. What he knew and what he understood, he told them to do. He knew that he was messing with the wrong God. So let's get rid of him because he destroyed the Egyptians. Look what he has done. We sure don't need him here in Philistine land. And they sent the ark back. What they do with it? They put it on a cart, right? It was a new cart. They put it on a new cart. They gave, they gave offerings. And uh, they, I mean, they did everything they knew to do to make the God of Israel happy. They did. God let them do it and get away with it. And then it came to Beth Shemesh. And that means the house of the sun. And when it came to the Israelites who knew better, they look into that ark. And when they look into that ark, they gaze upon the holiness of God. And what happened to them? Thousands of them. And one of them said, who? can stand against this holy Lord God, Israel. 
See the difference? Big, 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 big difference. That's what's going on here. This is what I'm trying to get across this morning. How that God has revealed himself in the Old Testament and he revealed himself up until Christ came. But once the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, it was no more about a revelation. It was about the man because he's God himself. You see, he's God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And this is what Hebrews 1 says plainly. He's God. So he came into his own. Who's his own? The Jews. And his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's what the scripture says. Here we have in the Bible an evangelistic message being preached by Philistine. That's strong stuff, amen? When's the last time you ever heard anything like that? The enemies of Israel. Something else, too. You remember what God told Jonah to do? What was his message to Jonah? What was the commission God gave Jonah? He gave him a simple commission. I want you to do something for me. And Jonah ran down and got a ship, a ticket on a ship and took off to Tarshish, right? He went the opposite direction. What did God tell him to do? He told him to go to Nineveh. And you know what Nineveh was? It was the capital city of the enemies of Israel. It was the capital city of Syria, of Assyria, the Assyrians. And if you look at some of the reliefs you find from ancient history, and there's all kinds of stuff out there, you can look at, 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 at they carved, they engraved in stone what they used to do to each other. And the Assyrians were some of the most brutal people that ever lived. They were brutal. They would impale you on a, on a spike and carry your body around so that everybody could see how victorious they were. You've got to keep in mind, for that period of time, don't ever judge somebody that lived 1400 B.C. by 2019 standards, okay? You'll be far better off. This is what we get with liberal liberalism. This is what they're, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to demonize our forefathers and all of that. And when they're doing that, what are they doing that for? Change your identity. Then if one, why do you change a man's identity? Because you can remake his identity into what you want it to be. So never judge somebody that lived 2,000 years ago by today's standards. You've got to keep that in mind. So, uh, but anyway, they hung them. They, they, carried, they used to carry them around. The Assyrians were brutal people. God said, go preach to them. He went over there and he preached to them. And when he did, in 40 days, he walked through the city, huge city, preached to them. What happened? He repented. Amen. He repented. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, any time the word repent shows up, it means that something real has happened. Amen. Amen. He repented. Put on sackcloth. Got right with God. Why did God want the Assyrians to get right with him? You ever thought about that? Why would he want that? Why would he want the Philistines? Why would he do that? Why would, why would he put that in the Bible? Why is the book of Jonah in the scripture? The Lord used Jonah as a type. What was the type he used him for? He mentioned him in the New Testament. He mentions Jonah by name. He says, what now? As Jonah was what? In the belly of the whale, so must the what? Son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? So he used, Jonah becomes a type. He becomes a type. That's exactly what he was. Jonah Jonah was a prophet of his age, but he becomes a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right smack in the book of Jonah, Jonah's loaded with typology, and it's loaded with truth. It's a powerful book. And, uh, and when you begin to see Christ throughout the Bible, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. He's all over the Bible. He ought to be. He wrote it. <laughs> he might have used a human pen on a frail hand to put the words down, but it's the Almighty doing the writing. All scriptures given by Theos Neustos, brought God breathed, God breathed, inspired by the Holy Ghost. Didn't mean to get to preaching here. You are you're turning up here and trying to that gets in my bones, boy. I believe the Bible, folks. I mean, I, I believe this book. This this book is a profound book. It's something else. So we have uh, we have uh, we have something happen here. Now, some of you have heard some of this before. And uh, I want to try to cover it in a way where, where it makes sense this morning. 
I swear I've been in here. It's already been 25 minutes after. Uh, turn over here to the book of, of uh, Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So what's a parable? A parable is a message that relates to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That's what it's for. It relates to that. It has a message in there about that. And he said that seeing you may see, perceive not, hearing you may hear and not understand, lest any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Now I'll ask a simple question. Here's a simple question. Why would the Lord tell these people that from now on I'm going to speak in parables that only my disciples can understand because I don't want you to get saved? Is that what he said? Let's read it again. Let's just take plain English. This is, what, about 8th grade, ninth grade English? Let's read it again. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That, this is the conditional, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not, may not hear, and not understand, lest at any time they should be what? And their sins should be what? Now, digest that for a minute. <laughs> Did he come to set the captive free? Did he not read from Isaiah 61? Did he not say the, the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the day is here? The Lord has sent me to heal the sick. He sent me to, to uh, lift up the brokenhearted. And here he tells them, well, no time. I'm going to speak to them in parables so that seeing you may not see and not perceive, that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Now, of course, this opens up all kinds of things when you talk like this because it just lays, it just, I mean, it forces you to think, well, now, good night, man. If he, if, he, if, he, if he closed off their eyes and he closed off their ears, I mean, here he is. He's saying, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear, right? You say that? Sure he did, time and again. So what's going on here? What's going on? Look at Luke chapter 16. One of our greatest problems and faults, and I understand why people do it. I really do. I understand it. And I'm not up here to be hypercritical. Not at all. But well, I am trying to show you there are definite divisions in the Bible. Look at verse 16, Luke 16. The law and the prophets were until who? This which, which John have we got here? Who are we talking about? The Baptist, right? The baptizer. All right, the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Now let's stop for just a moment. <coughs> How are wars fought? Why are they fighting wars? Why does one nation go to war against another nation? Why do you have one nation who has the gall and audacity to think that they should have an empire? What is an empire, preacher? An empire is when you take the sovereignty away from other nations, that some of them may be thousands of miles away from you, and you rule over those people, and you make them part of your empire. All right? Did that go on? Oh, it went on. I reckon it did. When you get in the book of Daniel, he talks about one empire right after another empire after another empire, and it winds up with the Roman Empire with, uh, associated with iron. So what's an empire? Theodore Rose, uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and, and Winston Churchill fell out. I mean, they really locked horns over that one thing. And what was that? Franklin Roosevelt was the president of a sovereign nation, the United States of America. But 
But, uh, but uh, Churchill was the prime minister of a, mu a much smaller country that had an empire. See, it had an empire. And as far as Franklin, uh, as far as, uh, as uh, Roosevelt was concerned, you overstepped your bounds, England. You don't, to be, you don't need to be ruling over the world. Now, how many of you know what uh, 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 colonialism is, colonies, Africa especially? How many of you understand what's going on there? You realize that these European powers go into Africa and they colonize. In other words, what they're literally doing is making a smaller whatever they are. The Dutch did it. French did it. Brits did it. Others did it. They go into Africa and they make colonies. They colonize it. And that, of course, went on in the 1800s. What happens? Well, people just like any people on anywhere on this earth, they don't like to have foreign powers rule over them. I mean, how many of you appreciate Russians if they showed up all of a sudden and you had a Russian mayor and a Russian governor and a Russian president and uh, said, now we're out for the best of America, but uh, of course we're Russian. Would you trust him? Of course you wouldn't trust him. You wouldn't trust him. So colonization is that when foreign powers go into Africa and they take these, they take, they take, they take Africans and they create their own little colony there. Now, why they do that? Well, they had a lot of natural resources. That's why I go to war. That's what war is about. Somebody's got oil. You go to war for their oil. They've got, they've got gold. Go to war for their gold. Land. We, we need more land. Do you know why Japan going into World War II? The biggest reason Japan went into Manchuria and was spreading out over the, over the, over the eastern, uh, east, the, the, uh, the Pacific area. Do you know why Japan did that? Japan's a small island, but they wanted an empire. And they went in, they began to take from other people, especially Manchuria. It's horrible what happened there. You ought to read it sometime. Just, just Google Manchuria and Japan, and it's, it's awful at the atrocities. And this took place before World War II was started, uh, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The reason Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor is because the Americans saw what they were doing in Manchuria, and they saw their aspirations to become an empire, and they began to shut down their oil. And when they did that, of course, they had to strike back. What are they doing? It's like all nations, for the most part. The kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You're going to have one war after another war after another war. Right now, we're on the, we're, we're on the precipice of a war with Iran. So what's going on over there? Well, number one, Iran are, is Shiite Muslim. Saudi Arabia is a Sunni Muslim nation, and they despise each other. They despise each other. How many of you have ever seen the, Ira the Shiite Muslim take a flag like this and cut his back and, and, cut, and cut his face and bleed all over the place? Do you know why they do that? They do it especially at Karbala. You know why they do that? They do that because the Sunni Muslim overthrew Ali, who was, the, I think, the cousin or the grandson of Muhammad, and they wanted a caliphate, and they wanted this caliphate, and so the Shiites separated from them. They had a final battle at Karbala, and they killed Ali, and so from that point until this point, they have despised each other. They hate each other, folks. Now, you don't get that on CBS, NBC, and ABC. You're not going to get it, but check me out and see if I'm not telling you the truth. Number one is that purpose. But number two, there's an issue going on with all these conditions, this, uh, what do they call it, the sanctions that the U.S. has put on Iran. So why are they doing that? What's all this mess for to begin with? Why did we go into Iraq? Why did we go into Vietnam? As you get older, you'll think about this stuff. You'll look at it and you'll say, what's going on? They no sooner get done with one war than they start another war. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That's the way it's going to be until the Lord Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, here's what's going to happen. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He will come back on a white horse. He'll come back with a sharp two-edged sword. He'll come back as a man of war, and he's not coming back to depart to be a diplomat. He's not coming back to ask for anything. He's coming back to take what rightfully belongs to him. Amen, folks. And the good thing about it is, if you're born again today, you're going to get raptured up seven years before that happens. 
like this morning, it would be good if we just left out of here all of a sudden. And then seven years later, you're coming back with him. The armies which are in heaven, they came back with him, Revelation 19. We're going to come with him. And that's going to be something else, folks. I mean, you think about all those horses out there in front of you, and you think about all this army coming down out of heaven, and then you think about the battle of Armageddon, where they're going to come down and meet the, meet the Antichrist. That's going to be something else. Amen. Say, so you're crazy, preacher. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I am. I believe that. <laughs> all right. So here's what's going on. Look at, uh, look over here in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 14. Matthew 13, 14. Matthew 13, 14. Okay. Matthew chapter number, make it go, to, go back to 12, 14 to get the context of where we are. Matthew 12, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him. How they might do what? They intended to destroy him. Okay. Now this is quite remarkable when you see this. Look at John chapter number 11 and verse 53. John eleven fifty three. 53. Does anybody know the context of John 11? What happened here? What's, what's going on in John? What? Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Okay. Many Jews are believing on him. They don't like that. Look at verse number uh, 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to do what? Put him to death. They're setting about to kill him. They're going to they're get rid of him. Now, uh, in... Uh, Acts chapter number 28, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, and he quotes Isaiah 6. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Sias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known. Therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now, Bullinger, I recommend his companion Bible, Ethelbert Bullinger. His father, I think, was, 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 was greatly used in the, uh, in the uh, Reformation. But Bullinger has got some wonderful notes about what I just read to you from Isaiah chapter number 6. And I've quoted them before, but here's what he says. And I'll close because we're running out of time. He says the first time that this scripture was quoted, it was as if it was coming from God the Father. The second time this scripture is quoted, it's as if it were coming from God the Son. And the third time this scripture is quoted, who did, what did it just say? Well spake who? The Holy Ghost. Isn't that something? It is, it, is, it is the approval of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost working in unison to put their mark on Isaiah chapter number 6 as it is used in the New Testament to show why the parables are given and the state of the Jew today. Because when you go to Romans chapter number 11, what does it say about the Jews? My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear them 
not, bear them witness, they have a knowledge of God, but not according, they have a zeal of God, but not according to wisdom, right? So what does he do? He quotes Isaiah 6, where God hath blinded them, and that's where they are now, blinded. And, God, and how, how's, how are the scales going to fall from their eyes? The scales are going to fall from their eyes exactly as they did from the Apostle Paul's eyes when he went to Damascus and Ananias baptized. Scales fell from, he could see what he already believed, but he could see. And the scales are going to come from the eyes of the Jews too. When? When they see him. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Where did you get these scars, they say? He said, I got them in the house of my friends. There's a reckoning day coming, folks, for the people who wrote your Bible. The reckoning day is when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up and confronts them face to face. That day's coming. Amen. So we'll pick it up again next week. Amen. All right, let's, have, let's, let's pray. God bless you. Thank you for the time to study.